Hello everyone and welcome to the Constructed Criticism Network. This network is here to help you improve in Magic the Gathering at every level. From popper leagues to top 1000 mythic, we've got you covered. If you want to hear the entire network, head on over to our sponsor at PureMTGO.com where you can hear each and every show, each and every week, and check out their sponsor, MTGO Traders, and tell them that the CCMTG Network sent you. Now sit back, enjoy the show, from YouTube, podcasts, and more, here's this week's episode from ConstructedCriticism.com. How's it going, everybody? It is 3.30, Friday, November 20th, 2020, and it's time for this, the 95th trip down the homeward path. My name is Adam, and I've got a few questions for you. Are you a fan of Magic the Gathering? I really, really hope so, since you're listening to a, you know, somewhere between half hour to an hour long podcast about it. Is there something in your life that takes precedence over your magic play? Be it a partner, children, grueling job, career, any and all of the above. In spite of all that, are you still constantly searching for ways to improve your magic play? If that sounds like you, if that sounds like something you need, well... I hope you got your extra mana ready, because we're about to extort some information out of this episode. But first, we gotta extort some in, we gotta extort some backing from our sponsor. I gotta remind you that we are brought to you by PureMTGO.com. PureMTGO.com is the largest depository for magic content on the web. They are just covered in all kinds of different magic content. There's commander content, there's pauper content, there's just general game theory applications. There's a little bit of something for everybody. If it's about magic, they probably have something to cover. So, puremtgo.com, while you're hanging around on the web, you can check out our parent network at constructedcriticism.com which is another one of those wonderful collections of great content on the web. I'm beyond honored to work with, you know, to, to create alongside the people that I do. Uh, that's all I really have to say on the matter. They're, they make great content, and to be included among their ranks is still something of a level of privilege I didn't think I would get to enjoy, ever. And then while you're around, if you want to support me in a more direct fashion, you can head over to patreon.com slash homewardpathmtg. This show and every piece of content I put on this network is on, on this, under this banner, if you will, is always going to be free. I'm not going to be trying to extort you for your financial gains. But if you like what I'm doing enough to help me keep doing it, you want to reach out and say, hey, love what you're doing. Here's a little bit to show. I'm going to appreciate it greatly and put it toward upgrading the show down the line. Now let's look at the three B's of improvement, budgeting, brewing, and breaking bad habits. And we'll start with our first segment, Budget Spotlight, where we look at an uncommon, a rare, and a mythic, and then a commander-focused card every single week that I think maybe is less expensive than it should be and why I think it's it's a valuable addition to pick up for your collection. So for starters, at Uncommon, we have one that's going to be a little bit against the grain in Zealous Persecution. Zealous Persecution is a black and a white for an instant that says creatures you control get plus one, plus one till end of turn. Creatures your opponents control get minus one, minus one. I know what you're thinking. Why? Why am I talking about this card? Well, first and foremost, as someone who's been on both the giving and receiving end of this card, it's an absolute blowout as a combat trick. 
you're if, if we're in a situation where attacking and blocking is happening and there's a lot of complex math involved this thing's going to throw a nice big fat wrench into the works of your opponent's math whether you're the one blocking or the one attacking Now, obviously, it's predicated on the idea that you have a lot of creatures in play, but it doesn't specify what kind of creatures those have to be. Obviously, its most popular use was in variations on black-white tokens or mono-white aggro splashing black in modern's early, early days. But it's still a card that's got some value even within the lens of different styles of decks in that format. For example, if you wanted to build an Abzan counters deck, it provides some legs there. It doesn't have to be just a tokens deck or just a white uh, white aggro splash black. If there's going to be attacking and blocking and a lot of math involved and you've got the ability to support black and white mana in modern or further back, Or maybe custom formats that you're playing. I don't know what y'all are about. It's a blowout. And I mean, even as just a removal spell. You play it and sweep all the X1s out of the way. So that if they want to block, they have to run the risk of losing their bigger creatures. Or you play it in the middle of combat when your opponent's expecting to make some advantageous trades and shrink the board. You trade one card for several of theirs. It's just it's good. And not for nothing, but, you know, even though we're not strictly a commander-focused podcast, it's obviously a great card in commander because it's an instant that's white that you can tutor out with Sunforger in the middle of combat. It's not nothing throwing that in there so at rare at price wise zealous persecution is going to set you back a grand total of 25 cents and this is according to coolstuffinc.com's prices uh they're the paper vendor that i've done the most business with that's why i use them as a reference tool is because that's the one i normally deal with but moving on we have our rare for the week which is soren vengeful blood lord uh, Soren is a four mana planeswalker. He enters the battlefield with four loyalty and has a static ability that says, while it's your turn, creatures you control have lifelink. Creatures and planeswalkers you control have lifelink. And then you have a plus two. Uh, deal one damage to target player or planeswalker. And then you have a minus X. Return target creature with converted mana cost X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. That creature becomes a vampire in addition to its other types. That's a lot of words. And we know how I feel about things that have a lot of words on them. But first and foremost, lifelink wins races. If you put Soren on a battlefield that has things on it, it suddenly becomes much more difficult to race you. Being difficult to race means, typically at least, on balance, you are going to win games you should lose. Because, I mean, you you steal victory from the jaws of defeat. Simply because you can attack profitably in more instances thanks to Sora. Now, the minus ability, the minus X is great whether you're bringing back a centerpiece creature for what your deck does or just trying to take advantage of enter the battlefield triggers from your graveyard. You know, whether you're buying back, and th- these are going to be some dated standard examples, but whether you're buying back Hero Precinct 1 or Ravenous Chupacabra, you can do a lot worse. You know, making, bringing back Hero Precinct 1 and then following it up with another multicolored spell is really powerful. Bringing back Ravenous Chupacabra to blow up a creature is really powerful. Bringing back Plague Crafter or Merciless Executioner or Fleshbag Marauder to make your opponent sacrifice creatures pretty powerful. 
Even something as innocuous as going minus two, revive Dusk Legion Zealot to draw a card. It's not exciting. It's not impressive. It's not sexy. But it does a job. And then the plus two holds opposing walkers at bay or helps to close things out. In other words, if you are trying to keep an opposing planeswalker off its ultimate, Soren can buy you a little more time. Whether it's trying to snipe down so that it's going to take them an extra turn to ultimate their Ugin or just trying to keep the plus one at bay on another one. Whatever the case may be. And then with lifelink, it also, you know, gives you a point point of life for whatever that's worth in the matchup. For our Mythic, and Soren, Vengeful Bloodlord, is going to set you back a grand total of $2. So you can do a whole lot worse than $2 for a rare Planeswalker with some very unique synergy. And going from one that's a a main deck, uh, an underrated main deck gem... To one that's maybe a little more of a sideboard all-star. At Mythic, we have Kaya Orzov Usurper. Kaya is one of black and white. For the life of me, I cannot remember how much loyalty she enters the battlefield with. I'm going to go out on a limb and say three. But you have a plus one. Exile up to two target cards in a graveyard. Gain two life if one of them was a creature. You have a minus one that exiles target permanent with, uh, or non-land permanent with converted mana cost one or less. And then a minus five that deals damage to target player, or target player loses life equal to the number of cards they own in exile, and you gain that much life. So, on the surface, it was one of those cards I could never get excited about when it was in stand. Full disclosure. Really... I mean, it's a, it's a graveyard hate card. It exiles some utility permanence, but like, I'm not excited about any of that. Does that make sense? I'm just not excited about that. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, mind you. I'm just not excited. On balance. The fact that it's a graveyard hate card is something that a lot of decks need in a lot of matchups. So it's kind of this interesting push and pull when you're trying to determine how much you want Kaya, whether you want Kaya. Obviously, you got to be playing black and white first, so there's a little bit of a steep hill to climb there. I, we'll get to that in a little while. But for Kaya, the plus one, minus five sequence where you just plus until you can all plus until you can alt, plus, you know, until you can alt and survive. That sequence represents a double duty because you are both hating on their graveyard. You're getting rid of cards like Uro, Croxa, other escape cards, um, things like prized amalgams, what have you. You're getting rid of things that are going to come back to bite you later. Gaining some life to offset the stuff that slipped through the cracks. And then the minus five represents a win condition eventually. Whether by doing it the first time after you've softened them up a bit with with the creatures of your own. Or just doing it several times over the course of the game and it getting larger. You know, it's scaling as the game goes longer. It's uh, not for nothing. It's also really, really funny in conjunction with Leyline of the Void if you bring both cards in at the same time. Either Leyline or Rest in Peace. So that you can, you know, Kaya doesn't actually have to exile anything with the plus one. But then everything they've done so far with uh, Rest in Peace gets exiled. And then everything else they do gets exiled. So you can just threaten to bomb them out of nowhere with Kaya. It's really funny. Uh, the minus one seems really narrow until 
you're exiling Graph Digger's cage so that you can resolve a collected company. Or until you're exiling Chalice of the Void so you can resolve your spells. Or you're exiling uh, a one-drop creature that's beating you down. Like, it seems really kind of sad to use a three-mana spell on a one-mana permanent. Unless that one-mana permanent is wrecking everything you're trying to do. And Kaya here, Kaya or Zombie Surfer will set you back somewhere in the ballpark of $4. And that's that's on the lower end for a mythic three-mana Planeswalker that sees a lot of sideboard play. She's surprisingly a very good card. And last but not least in our budget spotlight, we have our commander spotlight on Kemble Council of Allocation. Console of Allocation. Apologies. It's one a black and a white for a legendary creature human advisor. So, of course, Kemble can be your commander. We have a legendary creature human advisor. Uh, two, three. And whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell, that player loses two life and you gain two life. It is the simplest way I can describe. The simplest way I can describe Campbell as a as a commander card. Think of it like an Orzov R- Ristic Study. I know we have Smothering Tithe. But think of this like an Orzov flavored Ristic Study. Instead of drawing you cards, instead of jumping you ahead on mana... It's just gonna, it's just gonna bully them a little bit. It's just gonna take, it's just gonna drain their life, just a little bit at a time. You won't even notice it's gone until the fifteenth time you ask someone if they lost their two life this turn. I mean, it's a format built on doing unfair things with non-creature spells. Whether you're talking about doing it with a bunch of mana rocks, mana ramp spells, storm decks, you know, the the number of creatures or the number of decks in Commander that you see that are mostly creatures are pretty few and far between. Obviously they exist because the com- the conditions of their commander dictate it. Cards like, you know, decks with uh Animar or Nikia the Old Ways or uh, Carador, Ghost Chieftain, things of that nature that really want you to play creatures. But I mean, the command, some of the most popular commanders in the format are, are commanders like Atraxa, which one of its most popular variants is Super Friends, which are not creatures. And the cards you use to dig into your deck to find them are not creatures. The cards you use to fix your mana are not creatures. You know, you've got the the various forms of storm decks, whether it's Jaleva, um, Nibmizit Parun, Jorian Ruin Diver, uh, Jora Weatherlight Captain. They're typically speaking not built around creatures, and that gives you a form of leverage at your disposal. And, I mean, fair warning here. If you use this thing as your commander, be prepared to be the arch enemy. Because the fifth or sixth time you tell them, okay, take two, I gain two. And when they look at the score totals and you're at like 70 and everybody else is down in the 20s because they decided to play their signets and play their ramp spells and play their cantrips and play their play their free spells and so on and so forth, they're going to start to get a little peeved. They're going to have a problem. So, I mean, just fair warning. Now, Kemble is also a valuable sideboard card for Pioneer and Modern, for what it's worth. So it makes a really good investment buy for just the collection in general. Uh, it's a good sideboard card if you are playing a deck with black and white mana. I know it's already a bit of a reach. But if you're looking at playing a deck with a lot of black and white mana, whether you're looking at playing a taxes deck or just like a, an Abzan Counters that wants to be able to board into something to not get destroyed by the Lotus Storm deck, you can do a lot worse than Campbell. 
Uh, the fact that it, I mean, in in modern, it just stonewalls the storm deck entirely. They have to use a whole grape shot on the Campbell, or they have to be playing bolt. They, like, they have to have an out to Campbell before they can get the storm count up high enough to kill you. And Campbell will set you back a grand total of $2 a copy, so... There's not a great excuse for not getting Campbell. Should probably just go do it. So moving on to our second segment, we have our brew of the week where I'm looking at a deck archetype in one of the several formats that I play that I feel like either offers unique advantages or is just an absolute blast to play. So, for this week's, we're going to be talking about a sacrifice deck in Historic, and I'm not talking about Rakdos or Junt. And I know that sounds like heresy, but we're going to be talking about Orzhov Sacrifice in Historic. So, with any deck like this one, the core engine is the key thing. It's like everything that makes the deck go. There's got to be a core engine or there's nothing worth doing right well your core engine is the it's really eerily similar to the ancient like the progenitor if you will of the aristocrats decks in uh, standard all the way back to rtr with uh hunted witness cards like hunted witness garrison cat uh creatures that leave behind a body when they die alongside the Cauldron Familiar Witch's Oven package. In particular, the the one-drop Doom Travelers, if you will, are valuable here because they play really well alongside Witch's Oven in the sense that you can use Witch's Oven to make sure they don't get exiled by stuff that's going to try to exile the board. You can use them to pay the cost of village rights and still have an attacker. And worse comes to worse, you're chump blocking and getting another trigger either for the enter the battlefield or death triggers. It's kind of what these styles of decks are all about. But why would you bother going through all of that? Well, Corpse Knight... Blood Artist and Cruel Celebrant create opportunities for massive chunks of damage as the game goes on. Especially like either, if you can get two of those payoffs in play, like give me one Corpse Knight, one Blood Artist, and then we just get Cauldron Familiar and uh, Witches Oven going. Just that represents, you know, the the ping from when you sacrifice the cat, a ping when it enters the battlefield, and then another ping because of the cat itself when it enters the battlefield. So it represents three damage per turn if you're doing nothing else. And that's assuming you don't, for example, start the turn with the cat in the graveyard and a food token in play so that you can bring the cat back, ping them for two, one from Corpse Knight, one from Cauldron Familiar, sacrifice the cat, ping them for one, make a food, sacrifice the food, bring it back, ping them for two more from Corpse Knight and Cauldron Familiar. That's five. Five damage is a lot. And that says nothing about what happens when you get multiple iterations of Witch's Oven going, or if you have another free sacrifice outlet on the board, such as a Witch's Oven, Village Rites, Bolas of Citadel, Woe Strider, all of these things that provide your outlets to get all these triggers going nuts. Now, it's worth noting that these cards are not as good as Mayhem Devil. That's kind of one of the key weaknesses of the deck, right? Mayhem Devil is just an obnoxious magic card. Just objectively speaking, 
because you don't have to sacrifice creatures. You can sacrifice whatever you want to, right? When you can sacrifice whatever you want to, things tend to get a little obnoxious. You know, sacrifice my fable passage, ping you for one, get this land, play this village rights, sacrifice this other, you know, claim the firstborn village rights, ping you for one again, and you just keep going. But similar to the other, if, if you've got double, if you've got blood artist, cruel celebrant on the battlefield, and you resolve Bolas' Citadel and sacrifice three creatures, that's still 16. And that's usually going to be enough to win games of Historic or Pioneer. It's not as exciting, but it's also not as like straightforward, if that makes sense. You're also a little less susceptible to getting just absolutely run over by aggro. Because you have the capacity early in the game to make aggressive trades with your creatures. You have the ability to block those, those mopey x1 creatures you can trade two doom traveler effects into uh into a burning tree emissary to make it harder for them to ember cleave next turn you've got more ways to help cushion your life total like the jun deck can struggle against the against aggro because of the the reliance on Mayhem Devil, you've got to get Mayhem Devil rolling and rolling like crazy in order to catch up unless you just turbo out into Citadel and kill them. Or turbo out into Collected Company and kill them. But if you don't do either of those things, you can struggle because you have difficulty re you know, keeping your life total high. Well, that's not necessarily the case in Orzov where you've got access to Corpse Knight to drain your opponent's life total just for playing creatures. You've got access to Cruel Celebrant, Blood Artist, Cauldron Familiar itself, the food tokens from Witch's Oven, if you end up with extras. The advantage to Orzov over Rakdos or Jund, like... Rakdos and Jund have a very clearly defined place in the in the metagame in Historic. They're very good mid-range decks that, you know, thanks to the, you know, due to the virtue of I'm trying to use my words here. Thanks to the virtue of Claim the Firstborn plus Village Rights or Claim the Firstborn plus Witches Oven, you have pseudo unconditional removal spells in your aggro matchups. And I'm not saying it's not a great place to be. But in the case of this one, you've got, while you lose the, the straightforward and powerful nature of Claim the Firstborn and Mayhem Devil and Ramp Creatures, and if you're playing Corvald at the top of the curve, you know, you lose out on Collected Company. What you pick up is Redundancy. Instead of being all the way in on those cards and ways to find them, and in particular with a card like Collected Company, you are incentivized to run more three-drop creatures to really get your mana's worth. It's kind of the argument between blue-white spirits and bant spirits. Like, in order to get your real mana's worth out of out of bant spirits, you need to play more three-drops, but that makes it less good when you don't have the Collected Company. And it's kind of the same way here. Instead of being pigeonholed into this one specific line of play in nearly every matchup, you can take different approaches. You can just kind of curve out on people sometimes. Where you go like turn one, Hunted Witness, turn two, Corpse Knight or Cruel Celebrant, turn three, Witness, Cat, Oven, do some stuff. next turn play another payoff card and just start the engine and the engine will run play a midnight reaper if that's something you're interested in the other thing that's really cool about it is there's a lot of 
different sideboard options for this deck. Most notably, you have access to cards like... I don't know... White Artifact Removal to keep the opposing Graft Diggers' cages off the battlefield. You have access to... Stuff like Takatli Honor Guard. You don't want to play Hushbringer because you need death triggers, but like Takali Honor Guard shuts off ETBs, so you can board out your Corpse Knights in favor of Takali Honor Guard and shut off, for example, get Takali Honor Guard down against Oops All spells that can't kill you. Or at least one of their cards can't. Like Balustrade Spy doesn't do anything. Uro, less exciting because it also sits around on the battlefield. But, like, you have access to powerful sideboard cards. You can you can full force sideboard juke. Or you can play kind of a, a mixed bag in the main deck, and then you can sideboard into a streamlined variation, depending on your matchup, including the ability to kind of juke with companions. Uh, with Luris, it's particularly interesting because most of the cards I've mentioned that you're interested in playing, with the exception of cards like Bolas of Citadel, Woe Strider, and Midnight Reaper, all let you play Luris as your companion. So it's a situation where you can either reveal the Luris in game one, they assume you don't have the other things, and then you sideboard into a more powerful deck in game two. Or you can go the other way where you have a more powerful deck, they sideboard answers for your top end, and then you just sideboard down to a really streamlined, really low-to-the-ground version that just brings the pain to them. Either way, there's a lot to like. And then in sideboard options for black-white, like you get access to cards like D-Spark. D-Spark is a really good removal spell, particularly in Historic, where it can snipe down a lot of things. Notably, in Historic compared to Pioneer, we don't have to deal with Wilderness Reclamation. But it can snipe down Experimental Frenzy, it can snipe down your average Planeswalker, it exiles Arclight Phoenix, if that's something you're into. It exiles Embercleave. It exiles Questing Beast, it exiles uh, Glorybringer, it exiles God Pharaoh's Gift. It is a catch-all, as opposed to trying to be a specific utility, like a, a, a specific tool, a surgical tool, it's more of kind of a blunt force instrument. And you've got access to stuff like that in Historic. Leyline of the Void is another card you can board into. Of course, obviously, Jund and Friends can too. But with access to more options comes a greater degree of flexibility. And that's what the Orzhov deck gives you. In exchange for being a little less raw power, you're more flexible. You can do more things. And that segues nicely to our main segment. This week for main segment, we are talking about the Orzov Guild, in case you hadn't guessed by how black and white things have been so far. So, the first question to ask every time we do one of these color pair segment series, uh, we, we're on our sixth currently. We finished the Allied Color Guilds. This will be the first enemy color guild. Who are the Orzov Syndicate? Well, uh, the Orzov Sign, imagine, the best way I can describe it, imagine if all the churches in your area were also the banks, and there were no independent third-party banks. The only banks that existed were owned by the churches. And they also have control over your afterlife to the point that they can use your soul to settle a debt. 
doesn't sound very appealing, right? But you don't really have any other option. If you go into debt and you can't pay it back before you die, you'll work it off eventually. Capitalism to its absolute worst. Well, fundamentalist capitalism to its absolute worst. That's a that's a whole other discussion for a whole other day. They were introduced in Guild Pact in February of 2006 alongside the Gruul and the the Gruul clans and the Is It League. This guild of extortion, blackmail, and greed caught my eye right away because, quite frankly, it was a it was a style of play that was unique, especially at the time. Standard at the time was heavily defined by aggressive decks or control decks that didn't play to the board very heavily. And Orzov was interesting because it was a guild that wanted to play a long game, but it wanted to do it on the table. Your goal was to string the game out long and just let your gradually building advantages snowball. It was the home guild of Tesa Karlov, one of the leaders, one of the key figures in Ravnikan lore. Uh, she was one of the central players in the second novel of the, Rav- the original Ravnica block, Guild Pact. She was the author of the second Guild Pact, the non-magical Guild Pact. And still to this day, she played a part in Ravnican politics many, many, many years later. Even in non-Rav, it's a guild that typically depicts fanatical servants and their masters. Whatever it is, you know, these fanatical servants that worship with a fervor and the things they're worshiping. So what are the strengths of playing black and white together? First and foremost, you have removal. Black's removal tends to be very efficient, if a little narrow, while white's removal tends to be very unconditional but expensive and when you pair the two things together you become very much capable of answering any threat on the battlefield that's a strength that is a core tenet to Orzov the other the the second Orzov decks historically have a bit of an identity for being built around engines not single cards that are super powerful, but selections of cards that when you play them together, each one becomes more powerful in succession. And then because of black and white's mechanical tropes, which we'll get to in a moment, Orzov decks tend to be very good at racing. Which is to say, if you're both attacking every turn, Orzov decks tend to find ways to pay, to make that an advantageous situation for you. The mechanical tropes lend them well to winning via grind, and sometimes even without attacking back. You're racing without having to swing. And then disruption. Tax effects and lockout abilities from white marry very well to hand disruption and graveyard hate from both colors. So what are the weaknesses? Typically these these decks are very synergy driven. They aren't high on individual card power. Look no further than the fact that every Orzov based deck we've seen in the last two years has inevitably wanted to splash another color. You know, the the Hero Precinct 1 decks, we never saw Orzov Hero. We saw Esper, we saw Abzan, we saw Mardu, we saw Naya. We never saw Orzov. You know, vampires really would have loved to have been able to play it another color, but they were a synergy-driven deck that was designed around a tribal theme, so they didn't really have a choice. Not really up to them. 
Uh, and then similar to Rakdos, you can lose a lot of games to the top of the opponent's library. Which is to say, you can be winning and winning big with a good Orzhov deck. But then your opponent top decks Genesis Ultimatum and you get blown out. Or your opponent top decks Escape to the Wilds, draws five, hits something nonsensical, and you get buried in advantage. not out of the realm of possibility not out of the realm of probability it's it's a common thing that can happen you you will lose games you have dominated otherwise to whatever's on top of their library so what's the mechanical identity of Orzov well first and foremost they have the printed actual cards with the Orzov watermark on them mechanics. In original Ravnica, you had Haunt. Uh, When a creature with Haunt dies, it exiles haunting target creature. And when the haunted creature dies, you get another trigger. These these were uh, creatures that had a and enter the battlefield ability or it was on instants and sorceries Uh, a card that saw a fair amount of play at the time was seize the soul which would destroy target non-white creature and then create a 1-1 flying spirit token and whenever the creature seize the soul haunted was put into a graveyard from the battlefield in other words when the creature seize the soul was haunting died you would destroy target non-white creature and create a 1-1 spirit token. Uh, Belfry Spirit was a 5-drop, I think, 2-2 flyer. And when it entered the battlefield or the creature it was haunting died, create two 1-1 black uh, bat spirit tokens. So haunt was a unique mechanic in what it tried to do, but it was sometimes difficult from the memory issue side of it, right? Well, the second mechanic tried to give us and succeeded in giving us the most flavorful Orzhov mechanic yet. And that mechanic was extort. Uh, spells, spells with extort didn't do anything until they resolved. But then while they were on the battlefield, they said, whenever you cast a spell... You can pay an additional black or white hybrid. You know, either or. Whenever you cast a spell, you can pay an additional black or white mana. If you do, each opponent loses one life and you gain that much life. So by being willing to pay a little bit more, all your spells came with extra life drain. Now, this is obviously a great mechanic in Commander where you can drain three people, gain three life with every single iteration that you resolve. It's fantastic. Uh, but at its core, it was never a super competitive mechanic just because it was similar to similar to some others along the, along the way. Very, very built around the idea of managing a massive battlefield. That's not necessarily where you want to be on the competitive side. And then the most recent one came from... Was it Ravnica Allegiance? And it was Afterlife. Afterlife was always accompanied by a number. We'll call it N. A creature had, had Afterlife N. When a creature with Afterlife N dies, you make N... 1-1 black and white spirit tokens with flying. I continue to say the mechanics for the Ravnica block that we just got done with in standard were some of the most phoned in they've done in a while. And that's not to say they aren't good, they aren't meaningful, they aren't effective. But they're kind of boring. And that's what this is. It's a boring mechanic that does a reasonable job 
demonstrating what happens when you die in service of the Orzov. So what are some common tropes? Common themes. You have, first and foremost, the first thing that comes to anybody's mind when you talk about an Orzov deck is life drain. Making them lose life and you gain life without attacking. You're, you're just piling up triggers. One of these mechanics literally does that. You have a heavy dose of death triggers. Whether they be creatures getting a trigger when they die, or creatures getting a trigger when other creatures die. It's a common trope, common theme, common piece of Orzov identity. You have graveyard recursion. Small creatures that can come back from the graveyard. Big creatures that you can pay a cost in order to bring back. The idea that the afterlife is, is yours to choose. You have a heavy dose of tokens in Orzov. To the point that one of the most two of the most iconic decks in the history of standard ever were black-white tokens from Shard's Lorwyn standard and from Innistrad Scars of Mirrodin standard. They were just black-white tokens. There's a lot of tokens payoffs in black-white, mainly because of the white cards, but then you get cards that pay you off for tokens in black, too, whether it's for death triggers or for creatures entering the battlefield or just giving your creatures extra buffs, creating more tokens to further fuel the white payoff cards, whatever it may be. There's more recently, there's been a move to have enchantress cards put into black, white uh, cards, you know, constellation in the original Theros block and to a lesser extent in Theros beyond doubt abilities that trigger when enchantments enter the battlefield or when you cast an enchantment spell. And then most importantly, life is a resource. The idea that you get better cards or you get more cards by using your life total in addition to your mana. Whether it's cards like Painful Truths drawing you a bunch of cards, cards like Dire Tactics being really good removal spells at the cost of a few points of life. When you play black and white together, your life total is more than just the number you're trying to keep up. You're planning on using it for something. So what are some of the common archetypes, the typical archetypes you see when you talk about Orzov as a, as a deck building identity? Well, first and foremost, the first one that comes to my mind based on personal experience is aristocrats. And I'm not even just talking about the, the Ben Stark monstrosity that uh, dominated Pro Tour RTR. I'm talking about my first standard format was dominated by a deck that ultimately was just a black, white aristocrats deck. It was the most competitive I've ever seen wars of when it wasn't just, you know, a tokens deck. It was the most wars of wars of deck I've ever seen dominate a standard format. And that was ghost husk it was the idea of playing the, the combo at the centerpiece of it was Nantuko Husk with Promise of Bunray. Nantuko Husk, of course, sacrifice a creature, get plus two, plus two. Well, uh, Promise of Bunray says whenever a creature you control dies, you can sacrifice this, this card and make four 1-1 one, one spirit tokens. So if we swing in with a Husk, Clear out, you know, clear out the blocker, swing in with a husk. Husk plus one other creature represents two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve damage. Out of absolutely nowhere. And then you coupled that with access to cards like Dark Confidant, Castigate, which was Thought Erasure that exiled instead of giving you a Surveil 1. It was Agonizing Remorse without the ability to look in their graveyard is the best way I can put it. You looked at their hand, chose an online card, and exiled that card. You didn't lose a life. 
but that's what we did. You have tribal aggro, vampires, Kithkit. Uh, I know there's more. I know there's more. And I can't think like clerics from Odyssey Standard. Odyssey Onslaught Standard. One of the most iconic tribal decks ever. Black what? But you put all of these tribes together. They are fundamentally Orzhov. Like vampires. Use life as a resource to, to activate abilities. Whether it be Champion of Dusk's ability to draw you cards, uh, Adanto Vanguard's ability to stay indestructible, whatever. That's life for life as a resource. You have a lot of life, life link, which is fundamentally drain. One of your signature cards in a dedicated cleric tribal deck, whether you're playing it in in uh, some sort of eternal format or commander is profane prayers. Profane prayers deals X damage to something and you gain X life where X is the number of clerics you control. That's life drain. That's a, a core tenant of Orzov. You don't get more Orzov than that. In addition to tribal aggro, you also have non-tribal aggro, which I would I categorized as white aggro splashing black. I mean, I use the old ad, the old uh, shorthand just because it's easier to write and read. But we're gonna we're gonna censor ourselves here and go on with. White aggro with a splash, which is the idea of playing a, a really just the most efficient creatures you could at one, two, and three mana in order to facilitate a fast draw, and then you would use disruption to keep your opponent from breaking it up. Again, my first, we come back to my first standard format, hand in hand, was exactly this type of deck. It was white aggro splashing, castigate, Tesa, plague Drusalka and Hand of Cruelty. And then powerful cards out of the sideboard. But at its core, it was a very straightforward white aggro deck with Isamaru, Hound of Conda, Savannah Lions, uh, Castigate, Dark Confidant. You know, you were just putting bodies on the table, you were taking them to your opponent's face, and you were trying to gain advantage and keep your opponent from breaking your stuff. And then, hang on, sorry, trying to find light. It's dark here. After that, you have auras. Or actually, after that, you have non-blue control. So going completely the other direction. Instead of trying to play creatures, we're just going to try to make sure they never kill anybody. I can't tell you how many black-white control decks I've seen over the years. Whether they were well-conceived or not. And usually not, because black-white control is, at its core, kind of a bad concept. The idea that you can play control without access to blue, without the ability to deny your opponent spells. That falls right in line with the idea that you can lose to the top of their deck and do so pretty handily. Uh, Auras is a, a recent addition, thanks to Throne of Eldraine and Theros Beyond Death, where you have access to cards like Hateful Eidolon, Luris of the Dream Den, Karametra's Blessing, that allow you to facilitate these fast draws that just stack a bunch of enhancements on this creature, and you just have to protect your beater. It's like Boggles, but like with access to Thoughtseize and Hateful Eidolon to draw cards, and it's just obnoxious sometimes. Some amount of the time they just draw, they get draws that you can't beat. You have Taxes decks where you marry Black Removal. With White's mana disruption, the ability to make your opponent pay more for spells or have to take turns off because of their mana base. You, and then you have another classic example of Orzov, which is life gain aggro. Whether it's the uh, Daru Spiritualist with uh, Starlet Sanctum combo, the ability to sacrifice Daru Spiritualist after you've targeted it infinitely with Nomads on Core or Shuko to gain infinite life as a function of your aggro deck or the classic Soul Sister Ajani's Pride Mate deck with 
Black splashed in for cards like Eile Eternal Pilgrim, uh, Kemball Council of Allocation, so on and so forth. The idea that you want to use your ability to gain life as a resource. And this is how I built my commander deck, Karlov of the Ghost Council. It's exactly how I designed it. Was to be a life gain aggro deck. So kind of as an overview for Orzov, the competitive viability of pure Orzov is directly proportional to how powerful their synergies are. Which is to say, if you've got an engine that's good, whether it's Hidden Stockpile and a a Hidden Stockpile plus Anointed Procession, whether it's uh, Cauldron Familiar, Witch's Oven plus Payoffs, whether it's uh, Nantuko Husk, Promise of Bunray, whether it's uh, Token Generators like Bitter Blossom plus Anthem Effects, if you've got an engine that's viable, it really doesn't matter what you do around it. Just as long as whatever you do feeds into that engine, pays you off for doing it. Otherwise, Orzov is very rarely a great competitive option. But it is always super fun in Commander, where you might actually have time to set up kind of that classic Orzov feel where you get a bunch of stuff on the battlefield and then just try to nickel and dime everybody up and down the table until you can solidify a position to win from. So, that's all I have for this week, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, remember, if you've got questions, comments, concerns, send them to me on Twitter. I'm at HomewardPathMTG. Send them to me on Facebook. My name is Adam Spain. You can leave them in the comments below after you like and subscribe. Please please. Uh, you can, uh, obviously assuming you're listening to this on YouTube, but you can, if you're a patron of the show, you gain access to our patron pathfinders discord where you can have input on future episodes, including getting your deck featured for brew of the week. Or if you're a patron of $5 or more, you actually just get to write an episode. You get to help me write an episode just for you. So, keep that in mind. Um, And that's all I've got because, again, remember, I am planning to have a very special guest for episode 100. As such, I am holding off on doing dad jokes for a few weeks because I want to save quite a few of them up so that we can hit them with it at the end. They don't know how many we're going to have to the point that I want you all to find them and load them up, like get them ready. And then I'm going to put a thread up here in the next couple of weeks. And that thread is what I'm going to read it from. Uh, one on the one on YouTube, one on Twitter, and one in the Facebook group. So, uh, we'll be back next week talking about the Boros Legion. It's going to go up a little, well, it'll probably go up about the same time. But it's going to be recorded earlier in the week because I don't work Thursday. Thankfully, my, my job is, is gracious enough to allow us to spend holidays at home. And yes, I'm going to be at home. We are not going anywhere. My daughter has a surgery coming up at the beginning of January. As such, we are largely going to be self-quarantined until then. But with all that in mind, remember, especially we've got election drama going on. We've got holidays, which are one of the leading depression times of the year and we've got just the general gestures broadly at everything going on right now so remember that everybody's going through something please 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 remember the words of peter capaldi's 12th doctor when you are interacting with others whether in person on the internet or over the phone or voice chat whatever never be cruel never be cowardly remember that hate is always foolish And love is always wise. Always try to be nice, but never fail to be kind. So go laugh hard, drain life, but be kind. And be safe, everyone. We'll catch you next week.